a dog may lesson just not bothering to plan? That's a question for tephalologists. When I read this book, is it better to skim or scan? That's a question for tephalologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta? Or should you invest in an MA or a Delta? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Tephalology. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to Tephalology, a podcast about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephalologists. So we apologize if there are any sound issues with this episode. Uh, it might be obvious, but we're not all in the same room for the first time. Um, I'm in England and uh, the two mats are in separate rooms in Japan. So we're doing this over Skype. Um, so please forgive us if there are any audio issues and we hope you enjoy the podcast. TEFL Pioneers. So uh, this episode's uh, TEFL Pioneer is actually a continuation of um, the last episode's Pioneer. Mm -hmm. okay. um, if you remember, do you guys remember who that was? Uh, Fawcett? Fawcett, yes. Yeah. Lawrence William Fawcett. Right. Um, so just a very, very quick uh, recap on Fawcett. So he was um, born in 1892 in America. Um, he uh, traveled to uh, England. He studied at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. And then he went to China as a missionary. Um, ended up working as an assistant English professor at a university there. Um, ended up giving up his missionary work to be able to focus on English language teaching, but also writing materials, uh, doing research into teaching methods. Um, and then in Chicago, worked with um, Sir William Craigie. Um, and then also in Japan, where he was influenced by Harold Palmer's work, who we talked about before, at the Institute for Research in English Teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's more or less where we left him last last time. And we're caught up, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so let's see. Uh, in Japan, he published um, something called the Complete Pocket Guide to Standard English, which was based on his his own independent research. Um, I haven't read the book, and I'm not sure if it's possible to get a copy these days. Maybe you can. Um, but a an anonymous reviewer, who it seems like it probably was Harold Palmer, um, said this about the book, and I, I'm going to read his quote. He said, it is neither a grammar book nor a dictionary, nor is it a mere glossary of technical terms, but partakes of the nature of all three. It explores much of the territory that lies between the domains of the lexicographer and the grammarian, but in such a way that the result of the exploration is immediately available for the student. Mm. So, yeah, it so sounds like a good book. Yeah. Um, this, yeah, I, th that idea about, um, you know, the, the domain between, I guess, lexis and grammar um, maybe not having such a clear distinction as, as developed in later teaching materials. Um, even something that I guess would foreshadow the, the lexical approach. So in 1931, he was back in the UK. And I guess at this point he was um, quite interested in, in developing uh, teaching materials. He first went to Longman's or uh, I guess Longman's Green as they were known then um, but they already had Michael West's new method series underway. Right. So they rejected his ideas. Um, he then went to Oxford University Press instead, who at that time were kind of third behind Longman and Macmillan. Um, and they agreed to publish what eventually became the Oxford English course. Yeah. Um, he went back to America to work on that. And in 1933, published the Oxford English course, uh, which is now considered the first large scale complete EFL what they call a course package. Um, right. So basically it, it had everything. Um, the Michael West new method series had readers, um, it had handbooks for teachers. Palmer also had something called the reader system, which had sort of extra exercise books. Um, but the Oxford English course was maybe the first, which had a, a very good balance for all four skills. Mm. Is it still in print? It's, I don't know, to be honest. Um, but basically it's kind of considered the 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 main forerunner of, of a lot of the the types of courses that are that are put together these days okay um, it basically established oup as the kind of biggest presence in the efl materials world mm. um it, apparently ox it was called the oxford english course oxford english kind of became a thing um apparently before actually the the, the year that that course book came out and it was immediately popular 
is when they started calling their dictionary the Oxford English Dictionary. Oh, right. What was it called before that? I assume just the English Dictionary. I don't know. <laughs> English Dictionary of Oxford. Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> And, and Matt, um, Matt, would you say would you say this would predate like you know, we're in the past we talked about international houses teacher training courses uh, would this mm. predate that I guess I believe so yeah 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 I mean I'm going to talk a little bit about he about some of the teacher training he did later oh, on okay sure um, but yes it, I think it, it predated international house yeah. Mm. Um, so the 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 the, Zing, the Oxford English course um, and later adaptations um, were used basically all around the world: Turkey, Iraq, Malta, um, Southeast Asia, Africa. Um, and basically, it's considered the foundation of what is now Oxford University Press' most profitable profitable um, publishing arm. Basically, mm -hmm. that's where they make all their money. Okay. Um, but back to Fawcett. Uh, so in 1933, uh, let's see, he moved with his family for a year to Turkey and helped the Turkish government with the introduction of English into Turkish secondary schools. Um, 1934, he moved to the University of London, there, the Institute of Education there. Um, and it was kind of arranged for him to do what they call a, a kind of world tour, a research world tour. Um, and the, the purpose of the world tour was to, quote, study on the spot the problems of teaching English to natives of tropical Africa. Right. <laughs> um, the, the idea there, and again, this is another quote, to give, the, and when he came back, he would be able to, quote, give the students of our colonial department and others the benefit of his studies in the teaching of English to non-European pupils, particularly young Africans. Mm, so was there um, an idea that it was, um, that there was differences in the ways that different kinds of people had to be taught, like Europeans and non-Europeans and so on. It, it certainly it. seems that way. Yeah. Um, I remember when he was, that you said before he focused on the teaching of English to Orientals. That's right. That's right. Yeah. He wrote a book about teaching English in the, in the Oriental context or in the, yeah, to Orientals. Um, and I guess maybe the idea was here now he would move on to, um, to Africans. Right. Um, but yeah, there definitely seemed to be this idea that, um, there was a difference. And in, in, in fact, later on, he, um, well, first of all, he went on this tour and he went all around the world, Japan, Shanghai, Manila, um, uh, Africa, um, the Middle East, etc. Um, when he came back, it, all this traveling took, took a toll on him and he had to spend a bit of time in a nursing home. Mm. Um, but when he did recover, he began a part time lectureship and uh, in, in what was now called the colonial department of the Institute of Education. Right. Um, but specifically for te how to teach non-Western pupils was the idea. Mm. Um, perhaps there was a whole other department where they were teaching Europeans. I'm not sure. Maybe. Um, yeah, that but it, it is a curious thing. It would be very interesting to read like what, what specific differences were identified in terms of how to teach Western and non-Western pupils. Mm. It, it kind of seems like they're, they're treating non-Western pupils as like a deficit. Mm. You know that, like, yeah, yeah, right. teaching down to them or something—it it doesn't really seem right these days. Or the, <laughs> right, right. No. Well, I mean, Not it depends what they thought they were. <laughs> it depends what they thought they were identifying, doesn't it? I mean, maybe it was because they thought that people from different linguistic backgrounds had certain needs, rather than you know people from different kind of racial backgrounds. It, I suppose it depends. We don't know what they thought they were yeah. targeting. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's true. Yeah, yeah. No, it would it would be very interesting to find out. Yeah. Um, so let's see. In um, from autumn 1935, um, he ran the first ever year long TEFL training course at a British university. Wow. Um, and then in 1936, he published something called the Interim Report on Vocabulary Selection. Mm. I'm not sure exactly what this is, um, but basically he followed up on it um, with a, a, a huge survey, an international survey. And basically, I guess he, he sent out questionnaires all over the world. Um, and what he got was kind of word listings and people from countries around the world uh, talking about English vocabulary. Um, but the, the way his his daughter describes it is she says, basically, we counted, we, they, they received all these questionnaires back from around the world. And she says, we counted the votes for or against the words listed. I presume to get input on the preferred words in the different countries. Mm. Um, so it seems like a very interesting um, kind of bit of um, lexical research. Yeah. Um, things that I guess people do 
a lot with you know Twitter now and see, see how different words are used around the world. Mm. Um, and I, you know, even a, I guess a, a bit of corpus analysis, perhaps. I'm not oh, sure. Like the self-selection corpus. Mm, right, right. When, um, did, I wonder what the, what they did with this information, but just knowing that certain you know certain lexical items were more used in in certain countries. Mm. Could this have an impact on the dictionary? I wonder. You were talking about the dictionary earlier on, um, mm, mm. and maybe his maybe his relations with the dictionary. Perhaps perhaps this research fed into it. Perhaps. Mm, yeah, I, I wonder if they were if they if they thought about using using that kind of data for the dictionary. Yeah. yeah. Maybe at that time, possibly, but yeah. Mm. Um, in 1936, um, he, he became very ill and, and was no longer able to lecture. Um, but by the end of uh, 1937, basically, he, he had significantly raised the profile of English language teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, the Institute had what they called a Department of the Teaching of English as a Foreign Tongue. Right. Uh, yeah. I don't know when it became a, a, lang a foreign language, but at that time, it was a foreign tongue. Um, and that, that's basically it in terms of his um, kind of strong impact on, on the world of TEFL. Um, he kind of carried on doing stuff. In the mid-50s, he wrote textbooks for a Japanese publisher um, and for a Taiwanese publisher. Um, but then most of his, after the, after the war, um, basically, he, he dealt a lot more. Maybe he went back to his, um, his Episcopalian um, roots um but but most of his writing after the war dealt with what he called moral philosophy right um he said he was motivated uh, to he had a desire to promote international moral unity um whatever that is and a peaceful world through the cooperation of religious peoples as he put it do you think that his um his language teaching work was uh was influenced by those same kind of drives you know for mm. international understanding cooperation that kind of thing I wonder. It, it, it's it certainly seems like the amount of traveling he did um, certainly seems like that the, the, there may have been some motivation in that. Um, he, he certainly seemed um, uh, like more driven than the average um, language teacher or, or you know a second language acquisition researcher, mm. and maybe more than the average Episcopalian minister. Right. Um, so you know maybe maybe it was things that he saw in his travels and um, just through. Obviously, if you're teaching a language, you're 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 not just kind of passing through a country. You're not just uh, taking pictures. You're you're you know interacting with people a lot. Mm, yeah, yeah. Do you think yeah. do you think there's maybe parallels with like the Thomasites that we've talked about before? And in, in what way? I mean, <clears throat> um, and also the founder of International House, perhaps more so. Yeah, you know, they kind of have this other agenda. I'd say, not 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 just the teaching of English around the world, but they also want to spread some other message as well, perhaps. Mm. They want to get mm. more involved than just teaching, perhaps. That kind of seems like at that kind of time that that was also another agenda, kind of a missionary agenda, perhaps. Well, some people would say it still is now. <laughs> right, right. When I know we yeah. I, people, uh, yeah. What, what was interesting about Fawcett is he, I mean, he, he's, he obviously was a, 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 a devout Christian and, and Episcopalian, um, but he, he, he like, seemed like a very open-minded person. Mm. Uh, and like I said, he, he, he was, he, he, he gave up his missionary work for a variety of reasons. Um, but it seemed like the, the, the focus on, on language acquisition was much more, of much more interest to him. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, from 1956, he, he continued published work, um, publishing, uh, books. He wrote works on, Socrates, Buddha, Confucius, Krishna, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and Tolstoy. I don't know how Tolstoy quite oh, right. but fits in with, with the others. Um, Was that but apparently a lot of his research That's involved important. going back to sources in the original languages, mm. which he thought was an important part of, of understanding these people. Um, he died, he, he, despite his, his, his very serious illnesses early in his life, he lived until 1978. He died 18th wow. of April, 1978, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, he had only just completed his final book, the title of which was The Sayings of Confucius, a new translation of the Analects, based closely on the meaning and frequency of the Chinese characters. Oh, right. Interesting. Yeah, which seems like a nice kind of um, combination of his interests. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. So that's uh, Lawrence William Fawcett. TEFL News. Today's TEFL News is about a quite creepy English advert that's been on TV in Japan um, for a school called Seiha. Um, have, have you guys seen this advert on TV? Uh, I don't think I've seen it. I, I feel like I've seen pictures of it on Facebook and those kind of things. Yeah, I, right. I've seen it because I, I put it on Facebook <laughs> and, okay. and tweeted about <laughs> it as well. Yeah, yeah, um, it was tweeted from our uh, from our Twitter account, I believe. From the it, it, it was, I think, it was picked up by the EL Gazette. They even retweeted it. So yeah, it's it's caused quite a storm in the, <laughs> in the tough world. Uh, it is quite a, a strange advert. Um, so what I'll what I'll do uh, is I'm going to play the video. Uh, I'll explain what's happening, um, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. So at the beginning, there's a guy and um, a, a small child walking through a car park. And the guy says, uh, so the first thing you'll hear is in Japanese, the guy says, how is your English going, basically? So let's listen to the first bit. And at this point, uh, there's a kind of a nightmarish image. The boy opens <laughs> his mouth unnaturally wide and then mm -hmm. a man's head sort of pops into his mouth space. In, into or out of? Yeah, into. Okay. <laughs> into his mouth space. Well, from, from his mouth space, isn't it? Well, it, it kind of comes up his throat and out of his mouth. So it's like a child's head with another head inside his mouth. Like alien, sort of. A bit like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the guy appears, and this is what he says. I'm doing great. We have native English-speaking teachers at Seha. They've helped me to improve my English. And that little message at the end says, uh, uh, improvements in proficiency that you won't believe or something, or unbelievable improvements. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, the advert. Um, yeah. How does that sound to you? <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the... the I can, I can, I've seen, I've seen stills of the, of the image and I can testify that how creepy it is. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, I guess what's interesting is what it says about maybe the, the, the image or the, the, I guess it's, it's, it's almost a kind of metaphor for, for language acquisition that they're promoting. Mm, yeah. Perhaps, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but you know, this idea that there's, I guess what's, What's happening is that the English speaker is is not really speaking English. There's there's kind of something that's been planted inside of them that can speak English. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. For me, it seems like well, because the obviously the dad asks the son how how's your English doing, and uh, personally, a better advert would be for him to speak in good English. But yeah, they've got like this kind of <laughs> hidden, repressed, um, perhaps native speaker that is that kind of suggests that. Uh, like a native speaker is trapped in every Japanese person and they yeah. to be unlocked. And yeah. Or, or more like, more like the, like, like you mentioned with the aliens, more like a, this has been, you know, it, it's not, it hasn't always been there. It's just been, been kind of implanted in there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Out. yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I actually went and did some research about this school. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they've got this, this website's all in Japanese, so it's taken me several days to work <laughs> out what's going on. Um, but they have uh, three uh, points that are very important in all of their courses. It's mainly a school for children. Um, there are three points that are important in all of their courses. Point one is um, you can learn uh, or you can stretch your skill, uh, your listening skill in English by learning phonics from foreigners. Right. That's point okay. number one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the term they use, phonics from foreigners. Well, it's gaikoku jin kara manabu phonics shido de kiku ryoko o, and then I forgot the word, but it means stretch. Hang on, hang on. What was, was that a Japanese person coming out of your mouth then? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's, the, um, that's the, the first point. Now, the second point is interesting. Um, it says Nihonjin uh, Koshi uh, no Tanin de Rikaku Ryoku ga Appu, which means um, fro uh, sorry, Japanese instructor or Japanese homeroom instructor uh, will uh, help you to 
improve your understanding. Mm. So the first point is they listen to the foreigners and improve their listening skill. The second point is the Japanese teacher um, will help them with their understanding, apparently. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of team teaching, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. But that, mm. doesn't, um, that doesn't seem that different from approaches that are used in Japan, where you'd have the, well, the... And I'm, yeah, you know, the perceived native speaker doing all the fun games and stuff. And yeah. the, you know, the hard grammar comes with the, the Japanese teacher, perhaps. Right. But, so, but they're, they're, they're creating a very, very clear distinction between listening and understanding, it seems like. Mm. Well, this is where the third point comes in. So the third point is um, songs, uh, using songs and games, uh, we can we can improve our proficiency in fun lessons. So it's for, li, listen to phonics from a foreigner, have mm-hmm. your understanding improved by a Japanese person, and then play a load of games. That seems to mm-hmm. be the um, yeah. system. I, I mean, it, it, it sounds appealing, to be honest. Mm, yeah. If I were learning a language um, and I was told I could just, you know, get the phonology um, through listening to native speakers, have somebody explain it, it all to me in English and then have some fun. Mm. And by doing this enough times, I'm going to learn the language. Um, yeah, it's, it sounds appealing. Um, oh, I think they're just missing like magic pills that you take. That'll <laughs> Yeah. Teffel pills. Yeah. Tef- yeah. Well, what it, what it sounds like is audio lingual, then a bit of grammar translation and then TPR, for it, which are like the three things that Japan really loves like in terms of English teaching. Yeah, it's, it's right. interesting that you say TPR because another thing that they have, um, if I can find it, uh, is they have their own system of movements, mm. um, which they use to model uh, their uh, their own system of actions. They're called seiha action, um, which mm. they use to model different words. So they have an example of I like blue. <laughs> For some reason, that's the sentence. Um, mm. I is point at yourself, like is cross your arms over your chest, Mm -hmm. and blue is raise your arms over your head. Mm. Mm. So that's the international symbol for blue. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, So they're they're lying when they say seha original no action. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's not the international symbol. It's, uh, it's their own. It's their own original. Hang on, a sec. so you, you you've got to cross your arms and put them over your head at the same time. That's that's quite difficult. So you, do, you do one after the other. So I yeah. point at yourself, like arms over the chest, and blue hands over the head. You don't say the words like and blue at the same time, do you, Matt? So. <laughs> that's true. But also, this method doesn't work online over the internet, as we've as we've established. Because <laughs> well, well, it would if you're much online learning at this school. Apparently. Yeah, but I, I, Matt, I think you've you've hit on something. I think they've 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 just kind of meshed together a few different approaches, which they think are popular in Japan. Yeah, well, that's what it appears to be. But that, I mean, obviously, they're not the first school to kind of do that and think it's original, you know. Right, right. You know, but that's yeah, but if yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess if you're starting a, a what you hope to be a big chain of of language schools, um, it, those might be easy things to to. Selling, you know, easy points to reference. Yeah, yeah. They've they've actually got their own special system. You know, like you've got PPP, TTT. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've their system is APDE. <laughs> Isn't okay. quite as catchy. Hang on. Um, APDE. 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 Yeah. So that what does that stand for? Acquisition, proficiency, nope. development. Nope. No. Because <laughs> they're good. They're good words. I mean, they should really use those words. But they are. It's, it's a lot simpler, though. It's assess, okay. plan, do, evaluate, which is basically TTT with a plan mm-hmm. in there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so because it's assess and evaluate sort of mean the same thing. Is that for teachers <laughs> or for students? Uh, well, they, they just say this is the uh, the approach. I mean, I'm assuming this is the teaching approach. Assess, plan, do, evaluate. Um, mm. So... Yeah, so the the uh, the teacher will assess the uh, the understanding of th- uh, the the uh, proficiency of the student. Um, then they will plan a lesson uh, catered to the situation of the student. Uh, then they'll do the lesson, and then their uh, proficiency will be evaluated again. So it is just TTT. 
but mm. it's apti. But it's apti. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think this is more for their adult classes or their high school classes. Mm. But yeah. Just going back to that video, uh, sorry, the um, the advertisement. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, how do you think the two relate then, their approach and, and the what they're presenting in in the commercial? Well, interestingly, mm. I, I don't feel that they're that connected. I mean, I think that they're, you know, obviously they do have, you know, native English speakers in this school and they're using them. Uh, to teach the phonics but like they don't mention the Japanese teachers in this and they don't mention their approach so I think they're just playing off the whole you know kind of native speaker foreigner uh, image thing mm. as a way of promoting their business right I, might, I guess maybe the one connection is that you know when the when the child is asked by the parent what they learned at their seha class mm. and they open their mouth and what comes out it may just be completely parroting something they heard from from the native speaker yeah yeah that's that's what it seems to show because it seems to show like the the kid's not in control of what he's saying mm, and right simply parroting sounds that he's heard which is probably one of and that's one of their selling points it was funny yeah, yeah. from foreigners which is probably what all that he's got maybe i don't know i, I think it's it be a, a new business all in itself phonics from foreigners <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't Fawcett write yeah. that book before he died? <laughs> <laughs> he did, actually, early on. As well. <laughs> That's his biography. <laughs> yeah. um, well, anyway, I think that it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. It gives you a glimpse into how um, a lot of uh, Japanese schools sell their courses and how you know, uh, people think Japanese students would like their classes to be taught, this, this advert. And also it gives us an idea of what might have happened if David Lynch had directed an EFL advert. <laughs> Um, anyway. they, they, you know, they do get a lot of guest celebrities in their ads here. Maybe he did, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Rob, also, did you see that Berlitz did a very similar advert even before this this Japanese company? I saw that. Uh, yeah, I, I did see that. Yeah. And their tagline was very obvious. It was exactly the same. Like a, a person with a. It was a. It was a still image with a person with different people in their mouth. <laughs> That <laughs> might have to rephrase phrasing that, that phrase. <laughs> um, that, that wasn't, that wasn't they, an ad you they saw. Were, they were a lot more expensive. They, they had a strap line under it, strap mm. line, that, uh, sorry, anyway, um, that said, speak like a native. And it, it was very clear. Right. And they, and they had different natives of different languages in, in their mouths. <laughs> Basically. <It's, laughs> It really is the, um, I mean, you know, it's it's the opposite of like language identity or any of that. It's it's you know, you learn a language, but you don't have to adopt any of the identity of mm. of the target language at all. Yeah, you just regurgitate, mm. literally regurgitate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, if you uh, if you'd like to see that, we'll uh, we'll tweet a link out to the advert along with this episode when it's released, um, and. Yeah, that's uh, today's TEFL news. TEFL cultures. So for today's TEFL culture, I'd like to talk about job advertising. Um, and this topic, well, it kind of follows on from Rob's earlier section, actually, but also Rob's uh, piece about the descriptions of native speakers from the last episode, um, if you can remember that. Um, can you remember that? Good. Okay. And also, I went to a forum a couple of weeks back, so it's kind of in response to some things that I found out at this forum. Um, so to introduce this section, I'd like to just read a quote from a well-known English teaching magazine that we have here in Japan. I, w I won't say the name of the magazine, but that should be quite clear, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll just read the quote. Any job advertisement that discriminates on the basis of gender, race, age, or nationality must be modified. Mm. That, that seems fairly standard. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, want, I want to ask, is, is advertising for native speakers not discrimination? It is. I, I think that the, the TESOL Association in America has um, a, a thing that any any organization that advertises through them can't advertise for native or non-native speak like can't include speakerhood as part of the advertising oh, really? system yeah it's interesting oh. mm. well that that seems like quite a new thing because uh, yeah certainly a lot of places which i'll talk about later on don't really make those distinctions at mm. all yeah. 
Mm. But I'd argue that it is discrimination and maybe should be added to that list as well. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, and this follows on. I was, I was recently looking at jobs, not because I want to leave my current job, but I just wanted to see, <laughs> I, I just wanted to see what was available in my hometown in the UK, just out mm. of interest, what's going on over there. Mm. And I came across one advert that read um, very clearly native speakers only. If you are non native, mm. do not apply. Wow. So this seems quite aggressive, and I'd say this is discrimination, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. I wonder if that is legal, even. Mm. Yeah, but interestingly, I've since checked again, tried to find it again before this episode, and it's it's gone. They've changed the title. Mm. Well, they've changed the description to simply saying "effective communicator." Right. Which I <laughs> right. Yeah. I wonder if that's in response to anybody contacting them, perhaps. Possibly. Mm. I know that I, yeah, I imagine it is illegal. I, I used to hire teachers in the UK and I, I so I should know better. Um, but we certainly never, um, well, we didn't care. Basically we would, we, we hired non-native teachers as well. So we, we wouldn't have asked for it anyway. Um, but I, I'm definitely aware of, yeah, like, like you said, more kind of euphemistic ways of, of trying to weed out, what they think of as non-native teachers. I mean, this this particular job advert was for a summer school in the UK with obviously students from all around mm. the world coming to the UK. So I, I think you yeah. could argue that they perhaps want somebody who knows a bit about British culture, but that doesn't impl- imply native speaker. No. And no. A, a native speaker could be an American or an Australian or a New Zealander or a South African or, you know... Mm. Lots of other groups of people who wouldn't necessarily know anything about British culture in the first place. Yeah, so that, right. That seemed interesting, but as I say, it looks like it has been removed. But anyway, that was there. Um, without covering too much of uh, what you talked about, Rob, in your last time, so it appears that the, the ELT industry itself kind of still sponsors the use of native speaker or the the yeah. idea of a native speaker. I um, mean, particularly advertising campaigns and also university advertisements. Right. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I often see on the train, they, they usually foreground perhaps a white person or a foreign person yeah. in their drive to get students in. And certainly the institution where we work, they kind of do that to an extent as well, but not maybe not as much, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, now the, the, the job adverts for universities uh, in Japan, they, have, they usually say... Um, Native for the part-time jobs that you're more likely to see native speaker for the full-time faculty jobs they're more likely to say a very high command of English or a native like command of English or something like that mm-hmm. um, but, but the part-time positions are very often you know we want a native speaker to teach these two communication classes or whatever mm. yeah That's right. yeah I, after after Rob's section the last episode it, I was I was wondering because the uh, it's obviously very problematic having these terms, um, native speaker and non-native speaker. Um, but I, I think sometimes we, we we know what's meant by it. Um, yeah. And uh, if, for example, the some of I think the one of the teachers' guides um, that I've been involved in 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 writing. We, we, I think we wanted to say something about how we want to prepare students for speaking to both native and non-native speakers of English. Mm. And, I, and I think that's the wording that, that was used. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we all know what, what's meant by that. Um, but I'm, I'm just wondering what, what, what would be a, a, a fairer way of, of, of saying that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Damien Rivers, just, just following on, Damien Rivers 2015 tries to, tries to provide evidence for, um, what a native speaker is and he he uses this term legitimate legitimacies legitimate Mm -hmm. and he kind of argues that we can assume that an english native english teachers are white that they originate from a select number of specific countries and that they possess an innate mastery of the language and are therefore more appropriate for certain teaching jobs and he he provides evidence for this in the way of other studies that he's done, other analysis of, of ad, job adverts and whatnot. So he kind of says that this is this is a legitimate qualification for a socio-semiotic association of the native speaker. 
he's not mm -hmm. he's not saying he agrees with this he's just saying that's mm -hmm. the kind of myth that exists in the ether of the english teaching world basically yeah mm. and i think that applies to, uh matthew to what you were asking you said that um you know you, you you've used these terms and you 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 know people kind of know what's meant by those terms mm. um i think people know what they mean when they use the terms but i'm not sure they always know what other people mean when they use the terms um, so, for example, like if you're saying native speaker, for you, that could mean people from lots of different backgrounds. But for the people who are going to read that, they might have a very different image of their, in their head, like a, very, a much more strongly racialized image than, than you intend. I think that could be the issue there. Um, but, I mean, I, if, I'd, mm. I'd say something like uh, speakers um, you know, uh, can help you interact with speakers from uh, all over the world or something like that speaks mm. English from a variety of different backgrounds, mm. that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, the term itself is problematic, and I think a lot of people are calling for it to be removed altogether. Um, but when I went to this forum a couple of weeks back, there was quite an angry Filipino woman who kind of put her hand up during the talk and said, well, I've, I want to be a native speaker. I've had to battle with um being regarded as a native speaker so for her it kind of seems like um a position that she treasures the this idea of applying for native speakers jobs and being taken on as a native speaker mm. so i mean for me that misses the point slightly i think mm. the, if the whole term is removed altogether then it will we'll all be on a level footing but this woman was kind of coming at it from a position as if she kind of wanted ownership of that that status. Yeah, well, that's a very complex issue, isn't it, in identity politics? Obviously, for her, native speaker has lots of positive connotations, and perhaps it's, uh, you know, for her, it's it's been a goal. Um, I mean, the the way around that, I guess, would be to try and remove it as a goal for learning. But you know, it. it it is very complicated. Yeah. Well, the, the, pro the problem is, and the problem that's been highlighted by a lot of researchers is why, why is nativeness a qualification for jobs? Mm. Um, and this is something that not many people can kind of seem to answer, really. Um, so I'll just talk about a couple of studies that have been conducted to kind of find out the wording of these job advertisements, uh, similar to the one I talked about earlier on. Um, so in 2013, Maboob and Golden... 2013, uh, analyzed 77 advertisements from East Asia and the Middle East. And there were seven factors that they established. So they found, obviously, age, gender, nationality, race, education, and experience, and also nativeness. These were the seven factors that kept reoccurring in their study. Um, now, out of these factors, what, what do you think was mentioned the least? Uh, age? Age? Okay, and what what do you think was mentioned the most? Uh, what what were they again? <laughs> Age, gender, nationality, race, education, experience, and nativeness. Um, mm. Education. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can guess guess the segment that this is. I'll say I'll say nativeness. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So nativeness was mentioned at most. Um, so in 61 of the 77 adverts, um, nativeness was a requirement for the job. Yeah. And this ranked higher than educational experiential preferences. Mm. So education had 53 mentions, with nativeness having 61 mentions. And so in total, 79% of advertisements used the term native speaker. So I, I, quite surprising. Mm. 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 I, I wonder if if a um, uh, maybe what what the employers consider a non-native speaker, if, if, an, if somebody like that went to the job, applied for the job anyway, mm. Mm. Um, and you know, when confronted with or if they're asked for a definition of of nativeness, I wonder what they would come up with. Well, that's, yeah. that's the thing. That's the problem with it. It's kind of a myth in itself. And, nobody, mm. you know, like obviously Rivers talked about these legitimacies and that, that's kind of what people expect. Mm. But it's not always mm. true, obviously. And there's been other studies that support this too. Uh, Slivai, I hope I'm saying that right, 2010 found that out of his, he, he looked at online advertisements on, for example, things like Tefl.com. 
and those kind of websites. And he found, yeah, 60% in all of the database mentioned nativeness as a job re- requirement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's across the board, you know. I, I wonder if, um, if it, I, actually, I wonder if it is across the board, um, because obviously there are lots of different sectors in TEFL. I wonder if these are broken down sector by sector. So at, mm-hmm. that, at the talk that we saw given by um, Enric Yerder at uh, the uh, Native Speakerism Symposium, he points out that in uh, in Spain, it's much easier for you know native speakers to get jobs in language schools, um, but it's much more difficult for them to get jobs, you know, like stable jobs within public sector as uh, you know high school teachers and things like that. So I wonder if you broke it down sector by sector, if some of the effect would be reduced, or if it would only apply to certain sectors. Yeah, that's it. I mean, within, yeah, I think. Sorry, within the context of Japan. Um, there seems to be kind of a counter struggle. So a lot, a lot of adverts are removing native speaker as a requirement, but what they're mm-hmm. doing instead is asking for Japanese proficiency. Mm. And this, this could be regarded by, this was mentioned by Usui 2010 as petite nationalism. Right. You know, we'll, we'll give you this, but mm-hmm. you also need to have this, you know, so it's kind of a counter, a bit of a counter struggle. So yeah. obviously there's benefits to having Japanese proficiency, but why should this mm. be directly mentioned to the job of English teaching? Perhaps? Well, I mean, I, I guess it's to do with, with any kind of um, job. I mean, I, 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 I struggle with this a little bit because my Japanese proficiency is it's all right. It's not great. Um, but I, I wonder if, you know, if you have people on Japanese programs at English universities, um, you know, would you get a single one of those, in, you know, if, if you've got a Japanese language instructor coming from Japan, would you get anyone hired in those programs who wasn't highly proficient in English as well? Right. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, I, I struggle with it. It's, yeah. I think I think one of the issues is for a lot of employers when, when they when they ask for native speaking teachers, what, basically what they mean is is somebody who has English as at least one of their mother tongues. Right. Well, I, I don't know. I think, I, I think, I think, you know, if you're if you're running a small Akaiwa or if you're like a little, private, you know, your own little language school, um, I think that's that's probably the number one thing they're thinking about with, with a native speaker, somebody coming from one of the you know the the countries that we think about England or America mm. or Australia and somebody who spoke English from birth. I think that the issue is why they think that those kind of people make better English teachers. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's to do with, um, yeah, simply not knowing, perhaps not knowing too much. And I think a few ramifications from studies like these are, like researchers are now trying to challenge these institutions as to why it's, why is this a requirement for the job? Mm-hmm. So it, I think in general, uh, Rivers, again, 2015, just calls for greater transparency and accountability. Mm. And to show evidence that supports nativeness as a qualification. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Perhaps I'll conclude there. So that's today's Tefl culture. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you'd like to contact us, uh, please send an email to teflology at gmail.com or you can follow us on Twitter at teflology. Uh, also, if you have the time, um, you can rate uh, and give us a, you know, a thumbs up and a like and that kind of thing uh, on iTunes. Uh, that, that does help out the show. So, um, yeah, if you, if you feel like it, please go ahead and do that. So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>